Hey there, crime lovers. Thank you for joining me. This is the Always Talking Crime podcast, and my name is Kimmy Thompson. I am going to tell you a story that hits home with me. I'm going to tell you why in a moment, but before we even start, I do want to warn everybody that, of course, since this is a true crime podcast and we're talking about somebody being murdered and their body being disposed of in an incredibly gruesome manner. Um, There is some sensitive material here. So if you are, you know, easily bothered by things like this, for one thing, I don't know why you're listening to this podcast in the first place, but if you're going to be especially squeamish about it, I just wanted to, you know, give you guys kind of a listener discretion, advice type warning, um, trigger warning. If you've you know, been somebody that um, has been the subject of domestic violence, so on and so forth. So I chose this case. This is the case of the murder of Hella Crafts. Some people pronounce her name Helly because it's spelled H-E-L-L-E. But I did some digging and some research, and according to the internet, um, it says that her name is pronounced Hella. Hella Crafts. She was actually born Helen Nielsen in July of 1967, and she was actually a um, flight attendant for an airlines out of Denmark, and that's how she actually met her husband, who would go on to murder her years later. His name is Richard Crafts. I don't know if you've heard of him. But the interesting thing about this story is the murder of Hella Crafts was the first murder that was actually um, ending with a conviction without a body being found. So her husband, spoiler alert, (laughs) killed her and was convicted. I'm going to tell you guys the whole story, but there was no body and she was the first, first person to be murdered without a body being found and the person was convicted. So I'm excited to tell you guys this story Um, from a personal standpoint Um, I know I've shared on my other podcast that I have. It's called Always Talking Shit. I have shared, you know, with my listeners there, my past relationships, um, primarily with my first ex-husband. And he was incredibly abusive to me throughout the years. I was young when I married him. But this case is so eerie and creepy to me. And I knew I just had to talk about it, like right from the beginning of my podcast. Um, I have to talk about it because this was actually the very first episode from the Forensic Files. And I remember being married to this douche canoe and... I would go to bed earlier than him and he would sit downstairs until like two or three in the morning watching TV, but he would always watch forensic files. And there were so many times that he would threaten me by saying things like, you better sleep with one eye open and just creepy ass shit like that. So like literally, I'm surprised that something like this story did not happen to me while I was married to him raising my three young daughters. And I'm not even, I'm not exaggerating in any way, shape, or form. But he was actually telling me about this story. He was telling me about this story when he was watching it on Forensic Files. And he was like so excited about it. He thought it was like the coolest murder ever. It was the coolest way for any husband to ever dispose of his wife's body. Like, I still can visualize the look on that motherfucker's face. Yes, I'm very sweary. (laughs) So if you don't like that either, this might not be the podcast for you. But anyways, um, yeah. So he was so excited to tell me about this particular case. He thought it was super cool. Like, he, like sounded like he was like a super fan of Richard Crafts. So let me tell you a little bit about Richard 
douchebag crafts background. So this dude was born in New York City on December 20th, 1937. He was one of three children. He had two older sisters, so he was the only boy. Um, His dad, John Crafts, was a very successful businessman, and he worked in Manhattan. He dreamed of living in the suburbs. He ended up purchasing a really spacious home in a really, really nice community in the state of New York. Now, he was a former World War I pilot, and he was also a college football player. Um, So he had like this super successful um, type of image to live up to for his son, Richard. But, you know, his father always tried to do the best for Richard. Although Richard attended private schools, he did not excel. He did not do well at all. He ended up graduating from Darien High School without any kind of honors, no distinction. I'm sure, like, the only reason why people would ever even remember Richard Crafts, you know, from his school is because of this murder and his, you know, conviction down the road. Otherwise, he was probably just totally forgettable. He tried going to college for a time, but it wasn't long before he dropped out and he joined the Marines in 1956. So while Richard was in the Marines, you know, he gravitated towards aviation so he could be a pilot like his dad. He wanted to follow in his dad's footsteps and he trained really hard and he soon became certified as a pilot in the 1950s. He was transferred to Korea and Japan. He also um, flew some planes for Air America while he was there. And um, they were an organization, this is kind of cool, they were an organization that was recognized um, by the CIA. It was a recognized branch of the CIA. So Richard was very narcissistic. Um, had a huge ego, so I can only imagine, you know, down the road later on, years following, that he would always brag that he was a pilot for the CIA and having to, like, throw that into conversations. Um, kind of reminds me of douchebag shit that my ex-husband would do, too. Like, always having to, like, try to um, make people be impressed by things that he's done or experienced and all that kind of stuff. So basically Richard Crafts is garbage. He ended up returning to the United States in 1966. And as a pilot, he didn't have any trouble at all finding work for the next few years. He actually flew for a variety of different companies until he finally secured a pilot's job in... 1968 with Eastern, who I don't even remember Eastern Airlines. Well, maybe I do. I don't know. Um, It seems like it rings a bell, but I don't think I've ever flown it. But then again, um, at that time, that was one of the U.S.'s largest and busiest airlines. So for the first time in his life, he was making like buku bucks and very comfortable with his salary. And I'm sure that, you know, he bragged about that, you know, being the awesome Richard Crafts that he was. You know what I mean? I like, can you tell I don't like this man? (laughs) Um, We all know a Richard Crafts, don't we? Don't we, guys? We all know someone just like him. So anyways, he's making great money. And although he has a busy, busy schedule, he still found time for the social scene. He was a womanizer. Um, He was seeing multiple women at the same time. And that's known, like what we call nowadays, as a fuck boy. So this fuck boy was also seeing other women even when he was engaged to others. So it didn't matter if he had a solid relationship, um, something that was supposed to be exclusive, moving on to marriage. He was always like looking for more women. The more women, the better. It like, you know, probably made him feel more important. I mean, he's obviously a very insecure little shitty man you know, to not give a shit about any of these women's feelings. 
So anyways, um, he ended up meeting Hella through work. So he was actually engaged to somebody else, but actually Hella didn't even seem to mind, which is weird. Like, I don't want to say anything negative about the victim um, because, you know, she truly deserved better. But um, I've never been the kind of woman that would be interested in being with a man if they were engaged or married to somebody else. That's just me. But some women don't care. So apparently, Hella didn't seem to mind. She continued to see him despite his other relationships and all the other women. They just maintained an off-again, on-again relationship, you know, probably for a few years, it seems. They fought frequently, sometimes in public, but somehow they always wound up together. Hella's friends were suspicious of crafts, of course. I mean, some of them showed open hostility towards him, like they did not like him. Most of her friends could not understand Hella's attraction to him. When it was so obvious, she was beautiful. She could have anybody that she wanted. She was, you know... Gorgeous, gorgeous woman. I'm going to post pictures on my Instagram so you guys can see just how truly, truly jaw-droppingly beautiful this woman was. Now, in 1975, guys, Hella became pregnant with Richard's child. And in November of, of 1975, they got married. And they got married in New Hampshire. So the following year... The newly married couple ended up buying a one-level ranch home in the city of Newtown, Connecticut. Hella had her first child, and over the next few years, she had two more children. After that, she was happy to return to her job as a flight attendant. Back in that day, they called them a stewardess, and in a lot of the um, background information for this case... They all, you know, talked about her being a stewardess, but I, like, changed the wording to flight attendant because that's what they're called nowadays. She was able to hire a nanny to take care of all three children, and her name was Dawn Marie Thomas. She was 19 years old. Richard continued his job as an airline pilot and was frequently away from home. So together, their income exceeded $125,000 a year, which was an amount, especially at that time, that put them in the top 5% of wage earners in America. Like, that was the 80s. So, like, even now, that's a good salary. But back then, it was a very, very fucking awesome salary. Richard managed all of the finances in the family, so Hella had nothing to do with any of the money, but that enabled him to spend a great deal of money on his favorite passion which was gun collecting. Richard owned a bunch of guns before they even got together and got married, but he was like super, super excited to always add to his collection. He spent hours each week tending to the guns, cleaning them, polishing them, arranging them. Um, Whenever there was a gun show in Connecticut or New Jersey, Richard was always there browsing the aisles and spending more money on weapons to add to his collection. I mean, I guess all people, you know, have something that, you know, they love. Like for a while, I was like obsessed with buying shoes. I've kind of controlled myself now, but there was a time that I had a couple hundred pairs of shoes and it was just insane. Like there were so many pairs of shoes in my closet. Like, I only have two feet, you know what I mean? (laughs) There's only 365 days of the year. So it was pretty crazy. So I kind of um, understand Richard's passions for guns. So I just equate it to Kimmy's passion, past passion for shoes. I still love shoes, but now I just kind of control myself and I live in a smaller home and I just don't have that much room to be storing 200 fucking pairs of shoes. (laughs) But anyways, there was already trouble in the Crafts marriage, aside from Richard's obsession with buying guns, buying guns, buying guns. Hella appeared in public many times with bruises on her face, 
which sucks. Like, I've been in that position. It sucks. So one of her friends later told the police that Hella was physically abused by her husband. The same friend also said that Hella was deeply hurt by the way Richard treated her during her first pregnancy, and she would never forgive Richard for what he put her through. After the children were born, Richard disappeared for days at a time and would never say where he was. He would simply pack up his bags and leave. Um, after many days, he would return, not giving any kind of like reasoning for why he was gone. Like, Helen never knew if he was away on business, at a gun show, or Lord knows where else. I mean, I'm sure he was out with other women. That would be my guess. But since he controlled all the money in the family and he made Hella pay for all the house expenses while he spent money on the landscaping equipment, tractors, mowers, you know, all kinds of crap like that. Um, she never really knew what he did with his money. Like, so it sounds like she paid for all the household expenses and he paid for all like the toys and the things for taking care of the outside of the home, which would normally be fair, but it's also fair in a marriage for everything to be like open so everybody so both parties knows exactly like where the fucking money is going like what are you spending money on like what when you're leaving town like where the fuck are you going you know like my mind would be going like oh yeah he's probably taking some you know other bitch you know on vacation or something and leaving me home with the kids and all the responsibilities and everything but anyways in 1982, despite his responsibilities with Eastern Airlines and his house seemingly in need of constant repair, Crafts decided that he was going to become a police officer in Newtown. Although he was not paid for his time with the police department, he took his job very seriously. So... Just imagine how much time that's going to take away from the family. Like, you have three kids and a wife and a full-time job and a home to maintain. Like, I can understand wanting to, like, do some community service or volunteer some time. But, like, again, this is like a man with a big, huge ego and probably a little tiny pecker. <laughs> and he felt like he was this big man being on the police department. So he wasn't even making any money for it. But I'm sure he bragged about it to everybody all the time. I mean, I can just imagine the conversations. Like if I was a fly on the wall and he was at dinner with people or just sitting at work having a conversation with people, I'm sure he bragged constantly about the fact that he was working with the police department. So anyways, he would always hang around the police station, even when he wasn't even on duty. And sometimes he responded to police calls without authorization. He would just fucking show up because he had a police scanner, which is like nuts. So about four years later in 1986, he was actually hired as a police officer in a nearby town of Southbury. His salary was $7 an hour. And he paid his own way for, like, all the training seminars that gave instructions on all the police procedures. So, like, the police department didn't even pay for any of that stuff for him. He paid for all that stuff himself just to make $7 an hour. So, he was, like, really, really obsessed with his performance um, while on the job. And he even purchased... A 1985 Ford Crown Victoria, the same type of car the Connecticut State Police used. He spent his own money with, you know, the family money, <laughs> not his own money. He spent the marital money on multiple radios, antennas, police lights, and a siren. So this is fucked up. Like, he's... A nut job, like, sounds like super, like, weird OCD, and, like, he's a control freak, obviously. Um, anyways, during this time, Richard continued to see other women, of course. Like, I've already been saying that. Duh. 
Hella was aware of his infidelity, but she tolerated it, perhaps for the sake of the children or maybe to keep up appearances. Or maybe she just didn't fucking care, you know? I mean, I get it when people are in marriages and they don't say anything just because, like, they're embarrassed and they don't want, like, the town to gossip. I mean, I'm sure the town was gossiping anyways. But sometimes people just want to keep up appearances and just pretend that everything is awesome. Like, everything is awesome, <laughs> even when it's not. <laughs> but anyways, um, I don't even remember what movie that was from. The everything is awesome. I remember. It's a kid's movie. I remember seeing it before. But if you know it, you can slide into my DM or you can email me and let me know what movie that was. But anyways, even though Hella tolerated it, their marriage was in trouble. She knew it. She wasn't stupid. She was actually a very smart woman. She openly spoke about the divorce with several of her friends. In the summer of 1986, she actually retained a divorce attorney, and then she went and hired a private and private detective by the name of Keith Mayo, whose name will come up again in a little bit. Anyways, um, Keith was a former Connecticut cop, and he was gathering evidence against Richard for a divorce proceeding. So it was shortly after, on December 1st of that same year, 1986, that the Newtown Police Department received a phone call from Keith Mayo, the private investigator. He said that his client, Hella Crafts, had recently disappeared and he feared that she may have been murdered by her husband, Richard Crafts. Mayo was adamant and insisted that the police investigate the crime immediately. Mayo said that according to his information, Hella left her home on November 19th to drive to Richard's sister's house in nearby Westport. But Hella never showed up at the sister's home and hasn't been heard of since that day. Like, nobody's seen her. Nobody heard from her. You know, she never went to work. Like, nobody knew shit about shit. Her car was later found in an employee parking lot at Pan Am Airlines at Kennedy Airport. So... Obviously, the Newtown detectives knew Richard Crafts very well. He had been a police officer, you know, for them for many years. He was a familiar figure. Um, I'm sure there was a lot of brown nosing going on while Richard was there. So he had formed a lot of relationships, solid relationships, I'm sure. But he had he had a reputation as somewhat rigid, as a rigid, rigid <laughs> patrolman who took his limited responsibilities very seriously like I was saying so when investigators interviewed Richard on December 2nd he confirmed the story and said that yes you know Hella disappeared but that on the night before her disappearance she was happy and she showed no signs of being difficult or upset about anything he said that he and his wife slept at home and when they awoke that morning the plan was for Hella to go to his sister's house in Westport because they didn't have any power due to the huge snowstorm that had happened. So there was a snowstorm on um, November 19th of 1986. So they didn't have any power. So, you know, he was saying that the last time that he had seen or heard from Hella was Wednesday, November 19th. And, you know, at first, the police didn't express very much concern over Hella's disappearance because it's not like missing persons reports are, you know, really rare. So the overwhelming majority of the missing people usually turn up safe and sound after a period of time. A wife who leaves her husband could be having marital problems and just need some time alone. So the police department did not prioritize Hella's missing person's case at all. But in the next few days, the nature and complexity of the case began to change a little bit. So some of Hella's friends and neighbors and co-workers were interviewed by investigators. Virtually all of them agreed on one aspect of Hella's disappearance. They said that Hella was a devoted mother who would never, ever, ever have left her small children 
in the manner described. Like she would never just leave and go away and not come back. And Richard just kept, you know, offering up different things like, oh, maybe she went here, maybe she went there. I think her mom's sick, so she went back to Denmark to take care of her mom and stuff like that. And everybody that knew Hella was like, "Uh -uh uh-uh-uh, no way. She would never, ever just do that. She would never just disappear and leave her babies. Not ever. Franz also told the police that Richard had been having many extramarital affairs, which were all well known, and that Hella had recently discovered that Richard had one special girlfriend in New Jersey who he had been seeing for years. Before Hella disappeared, she had told several people that she wanted to divorce Richard as soon as possible. And she also told people, like, if anything happens to me, please don't assume it was an accident, which is fucking scary. One of Hella's friends, her name was Lena Johansson. She actually obtained Hella's mother's phone number in Denmark and gave her a call. Hella's mom was not in the hospital. Hella's mom was in good health. And Hella's mom said that she did not expect to see Hella until the following April. So whatever Richard was saying was obviously a lie. When Lena told the police about this, they decided to interview the nanny, Don Marie Thomas. Don had told the investigators several important details about the Crafts household. So on the morning of November 19th, when there was that snowstorm, Richard Kraft suddenly awakened her at 6 a.m. and said that Hella was driving to his sister's house in Westport and they would meet her there later. Dawn thought that this was like super weird since Newtown had been hit with a severe winter storm during the night too and visibility was super poor. So like if it's dangerous to drive, why the fuck are you going to get in your car and like drive somewhere else? You may as well just like stay home, right? But because of a power failure, Richard insisted on taking the children to his sister's house right away. So he woke up his three kids at 6.30 in the morning, loaded them into the family car with Dawn, the nanny, drove them all over to his sister's house. Richard dropped off the kids and Dawn and left almost immediately. Like, he didn't stay there. They were like, what the fuck? Hella was not at a sister's house. She never showed up at a sister's house, even though she supposedly left before Richard. And Dawn thought that was weird. She told the investigators that Richard did not return to pick them up until later that day at like 7 p.m. So all that time, Hella still never showed up. Like Hella was gone. Like nobody knew where she was. So later that night, Dawn had asked Richard where Hella was, and Richard was telling her, I don't know. The next day, she asked Richard the same question. He told her that Hella was in Denmark, you know, that lie about the mom being sick. Hella also told investigators she noticed for the first time that pieces of the carpet were cut out and missing from the master bedroom. Richard told her, that he had spilled kerosene on the rug when the power was out and they needed to replace the carpets. So now the police department suspicions were very, very, very much aroused and he requested, or they requested that Richard submit to a lie detector test. So he agreed and he passed the test on December 4th, which is weird because like polygraph tests, I don't think they're really admissible. Like I would never agree to take one because while they're not really admissible, like if you do not pass it, like you're pretty much fucked. So like it was really stupid of him to take it, but it's so weird that he passed it, especially when we all know that he is fucking guilty. And it gets crazier, guys. So I don't know how he passed this fucking test. So um, 
they're still a useful tool for investigators, but since he passed it, it had the opposite fact, effect for the detectives. So one investigator wrote in his report that based on the polygraph examination and my numerous conversations with Mr. Kraft, he does not know where his wife is. But some detectives still believed otherwise. There was something odd about a professional airline pilot who liked to play cop part-time, who rode around in a phony police car and took jobs as a security guard for a few dollars an hour. They just thought that was fucking strange. Like, why would somebody do that? Detectives also listened to Hella's friends who were constantly demanding to know the progress of the investigation. So thank God that Hella had some hella awesome friends. You go, girl. Good for you. You know, because sometimes I wonder, like, I have some great friends, but what the hell? Like, if I, like, suddenly disappeared, like... How long, for one, would it take for them to notice? (laughs) And then for two, how adamant would they be with the cops to, like, find out where the fuck I was, which, you know, was really, really scary. I live in Pensacola, and, you know, all of my family, none of my family lives in Pensacola. Let's just say that. I have friends here and everything, but, like, my family lives in other places. And, um, yeah, it's just kind of funny to me when I think about that. So... Hopefully I have friends that would notice I was gone and pressure the cops to look into my disappearance if I go missing. But anyways, um, thank goodness for them. So she was, you know, very, you know, well, well loved by her friends. That's for sure. So the detectives decided after all of this to call Richard Crafts back for another interview. And I was looking online for like some audio um, and I couldn't really find it, but I do have the written notes from his interview, from the second interview, and I'm going to read it to you guys, okay? So this this took place on December 11th. Um, The investigators located Richard on duty at the Southbury Police Department where he was working the night shift. So the Newtown detectives called Southbury and asked that they send over Officer Crafts for further questioning. So Richard arrived at the detective division in full uniform at 9.20 p.m. I guess he was at work. I was going to say that's stupid, but I guess if you're at work and you're on duty and then you're called over for like an interview, of course, you're just going to show up in your work clothes. So maybe I should not be so judgmental. Bad Kimmy. (laughs) But anyways, um, they um, had some questions prepared already and they conducted the interview. So here's how it progressed. Question. Richard, did you know that your wife hired a private investigator? Richard said no. Question. Did you know that the private investigator has documented your relationship with a New Jersey woman? Richard said no. Question. Why would your wife tell her friends that she was afraid for herself regarding serving you divorce papers and tell them to check on her if something happened? Richard said, I cannot imagine her saying this. It is completely out of character for her to say this. Question. On November 18th, when Hella came home, when and why did she leave? Richard said, those answers are in my statement. Question, what is the story with your bedroom rug? Apparently you removed it or cut some pieces out of it. Can you explain this to me? Richard said, all the rugs in the house are being removed and replaced. Question, what was spilled on the rug in your bedroom? Richard answered, kerosene. Question, Did you cut pieces out of the rug? Richard said, yes, two feet at a time. It's easier to remove it that way. So it sounds like he had a fucking answer for everything, didn't he? Like a smart ass answer. So the next question, what did you do with the rug you took out of the bedroom? Richard said, dumped bedroom rug in the Newtown landfill one week ago. It was blue in color. Question, Why have you been telling everyone different things about Hella being missing, like her mother being sick? Richard said, 
I didn't want to say my wife was gone and I did not know where she was. Question. Has Hella received any mail since she has been missing? And Richard answered, no, she has gotten no letters since she left. She usually gets about two letters a week. So whatever the police asked, guys, like Crafts had an answer for fucking everything. His demeanor seemed like cooperative, yet guarded. Um, again, he wasn't caught in any outright lies, but they were more like half-truths. And just wait until you fucking hear the rest of the story. So for a man whose wife had suddenly vanished without any explanation, Richard Kraft seemed like so like blasé about it. Like he didn't care. But he was relieved at, released after providing you know, the police with this brief one-page statement that was less than helpful. The detectives were left with even more questions than before, but they were becoming more and more convinced that whatever happened to Hella, somehow, in some way, Richard Crafts had something to do with it. All right, guys, so remember me telling you about the PI, Keith Mayo, that Hella had hired before her disappearance. Well, he was not a happy guy at all. And he knew that something terrible had happened to Hella. And he knew deep down in his soul that Richard was responsible. So he could not get the thought of that blue carpeting from the master bedroom out of his mind. He decided that with the help of the local trash pickup crew, he was going to search the landfill. So he got a couple of people, can't even imagine doing this, but he ended up getting a couple of people to um, help him. So they went through all of the stinking trash like gagging and uh, I can't even imagine I can't I can't even imagine how many cuss words <laughs> were said out loud but they did this for many many days going through mountains and mountains and mountains of trash at this landfill um, they did find a portion of rug that was nearly identical to the rug at the Crafts residence. So Keith Mayo was sure it was the missing piece, and the rugs also had stains that appeared to be human blood. So they actually brought that to the lab, the state police laboratory, and it was looked at by one of the country's foremost forensic scientists, whose name was Henry, Dr. Henry C. Lee. I almost forgot the doctor thing. Sorry, Dr. Henry Seeley, if you're still alive or even listening to this. <laughs> Sorry, I know you're a doctor. You're awesome. So anyways, um, they ended up testing the carpeting and they could not find any positive um, blood. They, they could not find blood, um, which is weird. Um, but... What they did do is the detectives, he got the detectives to look deeper into Richard Crafts's activities immediately before Hella disappeared. So they pulled his credit card purchases and phone records for the month prior to November 19th. So this is very interesting, guys. On November 13th, Crafts bought a large capacity Westinghouse freezer at an appliance store in Danbury. He paid $375 for it and picked it up at the store on November 17th. During the same billing period, detectives noticed that he had rented some kind of machinery and that was a charge of $900. Hmm, what could that have been? So then they were asking themselves like, why the fuck does this man need such an outsized freezer at his house like like why do, like why would he need that like in that large of a capacity for a family of four and a nanny I'm not sure if the nanny was a living nanny I'm assuming she was but so like a so there was three kids right so six people like 
it was just, it seemed like unlikely and they were like really questioning and they were like, what kind of machinery did he rent that was so expensive? So it's now Christmas day guys, December 25th of 1986. So Hella had been gone for almost five weeks. So definitely over a month. And Richard was now saying shit like Hella was in the Canary Islands with her best friend, Helen Dixon, like just changing like his story about where Hella was and all kinds of stupid bullshit. But he did not know that the cops had been putting together a search warrant for the Crafts residence at 5 Newfield Lane. The cops had discovered that Richard Crafts had taken his three children to Florida for the holiday, so they decided it was a perfect opportunity for them to execute this search warrant. Dr. Henry Lee agreed to be present and oversee the collection of all the evidence. So on the afternoon of Christmas Day, which sucks, I mean, most cops, I, I've known a lot of police officers throughout the years, you know, they all try not to have to be at work on Christmas Day, right? I mean, that's something that, you know, obviously some cops have to, but um, they were all in this home on Christmas Day, a team of state police investigators and crime scene technicians they entered through a back window. What they found was an empty home in complete disarray. Like, it was garbage. Fucked up. Messy. Furniture was all over the place. Dirty clothes laid everywhere. Dirty dishes and kitchen utensils were unwashed in the sink and just like on the countertops, which is nasty. Mattresses were laying on the bare floor in the living room, along with boxes of toys and other items. So I'm like, what the fuck? Like, was nobody sleeping in their bedrooms? Like, what the hell is going on? The carpets were already all pulled up and discarded. A freezer was located and searched. There was no body inside. What detectives didn't realize at the time, though, was that the freezer they searched was actually Richard Kraft's old freezer. That new freezer that had been purchased on November 17th had already been removed and later discarded. So Richard Kraft got rid of that fucking freezer, like, almost immediately. So the cops didn't know this. Um, during the search, dozens of weapons were located and tagged, and for one of these guns, you know, they were wondering if it could be the one that killed Hella Crafts. Like, they were like, okay, like, they didn't know how she died or if she was dead, but they were, like, assuming she was dead. Um, so for the next few days, the search team was going over everything in that house. They eventually seized 108 pieces of evidence according to the search warrant inventory. So some of the evidence included many revolvers, um, let's see, pistols, rifles, semi-automatics, some kind of pump shotguns, um, a Beretta crossbow, hand grenades. <laughs> Holy shit, this guy had tons of shit. But there was like all, all these guns are like listed. Um, numerous clips and like a vast assortment of ammunition. So it was so, they were astounded because there was so much. Cause remember how obsessed Richard was with, you know, collecting guns and everything. They also seized hand towels, washcloths, fiber samples, and a king size mattress with bedding. So Dr. Lee performed a luminal test in various locations throughout the house, which of course tested positive for the presence of blood. You know, so they were looking for any evidence of someone attempting to dispose of a body. That's what he later told. Um, he wrote this in a book called Cracking Cases. Some of the seized towels were later tested positive for blood at the state lab. So... Even further, the blood was type O positive, which was the same as Hella's blood type.
but despite the mountain of weapons and evidence seized, the cops still had no answer to the most important question of all. Where the fuck was Hella? After this, though, things started progressing pretty quickly. Investigators learned that that $900 charge on Richard's MasterCard um, for that piece of machinery, they were wondering what the fuck it was, it ended up being payment for a wood chipper. So Richard had rented and picked up a very large wood chipper called a Brush Bandit on November 19th and apparently used it to chip a quantity of wood. The detectives began to think the unthinkable at this point. They were like, what the fuck? I mean, there was a snowstorm. Like, who would be, like, who would be needing a wood chipper? Who needs to chip wood when there's a fucking snowstorm outside? Um, On the afternoon, guys, of December 30th, though, um, two detectives found out that... A utility man from Southbury named Joseph Hine was plowing snow on River Road during the snowstorm. They listened to his story about observing a wood chipper and a U-Haul parked on the side of the road in the middle of the night. Detectives drove Hine over to the shores of that river of the Houston, Houstonic River just outside of Southbury. Hine pointed out the exact spot where he observed the truck, the U-Haul, towing a wood chipper. It was an area of the river known as Lake Zor. Detectives saw piles of wood chips along the banks of the river. There seemed to be small pieces of green plastic substance strewn about, strewn about and like intermingled with the wood chips. One of the detectives got down on his hands and knees and sifted through some of the material. There was, you know, cold wind coming off the river and the skies looked like it was going to start snowing again. So it was really imperative that they collected as much evidence as they could before, like it all got buried by new snow. The detective also noticed some scraps of shredded paper partially covered by the other debris. So he managed to find a few pieces of mail and through the little plastic cellophane window on one of the envelopes, he could plainly read the name and address, Miss Hella L. Crafts, 5 Newfield Lane, Newtown, Connecticut. So he shouted to his partner that something was definitely wrong here. So within an hour, a search team of police were descended upon the scene. So there were cops everywhere. Like, you know, they were like freaking the fuck out, I'm sure. They set up a perimeter and performed an organized search of the potential crime scene. Every single inch of the ground was gone over at least twice as the team took pictures of every little bit of evidence that was removed from the site. So more... More mail bearing Hella's name was located within like that first hour. So apparently, FYI, um, Hella had gotten her mail that day and had put it in her pocket. And her husband, Richard, did not know. He wasn't aware that she had mail in her pocket, okay? Just as an FYI. So um, the cops also found numerous strands of blonde hair bone fragments, fabrics, plastic items, wood chips, and many fragments of unidentified material. Every piece of material, no matter how small, would have to undergo scientific analysis at the forensic laboratory. Laboratory? Laboratory? (laughs) Laboratory. (laughs) That's kind of a um, shitty mess up, isn't it? Pardon my pun. Oh my gosh, that was funny. So anyways, they have to like look at it at the lab, obviously. So Dr. Lee knew that they were going to have to prove beyond any reasonable doubt that those remains were those of Hella 
and that she was murdered because otherwise there would be no homicide if they can't prove, you know, that any of that stuff is is from, like, remnants of Hella. And then that way they could not charge Richard Crafts for a murder for homicide. So they knew how important this was. The detectives went to the rental agency where the wood chipper was rented from. They secured copies of the agreement, and luckily the exact wood chipper was in the rear parking lot. This gets me so excited. So what are the chances? Nobody else was renting that wood chipper. It was right there. So the cops towed it over to the lab, and it was examined for additional evidence. Um, In the meantime, all of that difficult work, all the tasks at Lake Zor continued. So for days, all the cops, diving teams, um, detectives, they searched the crime scene area, um, a perimeter of a mile in both directions from the site of where the debris was found. The river itself was extremely cold, too cold for divers to stay in for very long, but the cops obtained permission to lower the water level. This is so cool. They were able to lower the water level by restricting flow at the power dam up the river. Isn't that neat? So that made the whole process easy since the water was so cold. Um, They located a chainsaw embedded in the muddy bottom of the river. Now, the serial number on that chainsaw had been filed off which seems extremely sus, don't you guys think? Um, But it seemed to have only been in the water for a short amount of time. So they took that and they had hopes that, you know, they were going to be able to um, figure out the serial number later. One detective also discovered a piece of human toe. And shortly after that, a fragment of a finger was found then part of a tooth. The cops kept going through all that river mud. The mud was said to be like knee deep. They were cold. They were probably so tired and probably tormented by, you know, the shit that they're actually looking for, right? But they pushed on. In the end, they eventually discovered 2,660 strands of blonde hair. Who was counting those hairs? I don't know. (laughs) But yeah, that's a lot of counting. And like if you make a mistake while you're counting, then you're like, fuck, I got to start all over. I can't even imagine. They also found 69 slivers of human bone, five droplets of human blood, two teeth, a piece of human skull, three ounces of human tissue, a portion of human finger, one fingernail, and that one portion of toenail that I had already mentioned. So Hella Crafts had finally been found. So on January 11th, an arrest warrant was issued for Richard Crafts, they were going to arrest him. So they were like working so hard for, you know, weeks and weeks, um, you know, since Christmas Day to make this happen. And they were exhausted. So that same night on January 11th, around 9 p.m., a dozen Connecticut state troopers and detectives responded to Richard Crafts' home. They surrounded his house and called him on the phone. They ordered him to come outside and surrender. You know what this fucking asshole did? Like, this just tells you what kind of ego fucking maniac Richard Crafts was or is, whatever. He said, I'm tired. I'll take care of it in the morning. When the police insisted he surrender immediately, Crafts became angry. Don't call me back, he shouted and hung up. (laughs) That's crazy. That's fucking crazy. Like, who does that? After more phone calls and promises of surrender, which were never fulfilled, Crafts finally agreed to come outside. His children were still in the house sleeping, too. Could you fucking imagine that? So... 
finally at 12.30 a.m. So this was fucking going on for three and a half hours, going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth with the cops. He finally comes out and surrenders to the police. After an arraignment in nearby Danbury Court, he was taken to the Bridgeport Jail facility to await further developments. And his bail was set at $750,000. So as you guys can imagine, or you might remember if, um, you know, you were around at that time in 1986, you know, the press was going crazy. Everybody was talking about this case, you know, of the guy that put his wife through a fucking wood chipper. Um, But police had worked out a probable scenario while they were waiting for the court date. Um, They kind of figured out how Richard had killed Hella. So since drops of blood were found in the bedroom, they assumed that she was bludgeoned at the foot of her bed during the early mornings of November 19th, maybe when she was making the bed or changing the sheets. Police speculated that Richard then carried his wife's body to the basement where he had recently hooked up the new freezer. He placed Hella inside the freezer and then woke up Dawn, the nanny, and brought all the kids and her to his sister's house. Then he went back home. He took Hella's body, by then frozen solid, to a secluded piece of property that he owned in Newtown. They believe it was there that he used that chainsaw that was found in Lake Zor on her body to make several smaller pieces of remains. So they, so they figured he dismembered her with the chainsaw and then returned those dismembered pieces of Hella to the freezer. And then the next day, you know, under cover of darkness and the snowstorm, he took these packages of the remains all wrapped up in plastic garbage bags to Lake Zor, where he ran them through that powerful wood chipper. So because of the time factors involved, the cops speculated that when Joseph Hines saw that U-Haul and wood chipper alongside the road, they figured that Richard had already finished disposing of Hella's body. Can you imagine how fucking gruesome that was? Like, freezing her, dismembering her. Well, I guess dismembering it wouldn't be as messy because her body was frozen, so there wouldn't be a lot of blood. So, I mean, I guess in retrospect, that's pretty smart. That's a smart way to do it if you're a fucking psychopathic murderer that, you know, hates your wife so much that, you know, you're going to kill her. But um, anyways, then freeze them and then st- then like shove those pieces of frozen body parts through a wood chipper to dispose of. I mean, I can't even imagine. It's so gross. But this is like the part of the story that my ex-husband loved telling me about. He thought it was the greatest fucking thing ever, which is so fucking creepy. So glad I'm not married to him anymore too, by the way. So, anyways, they figured that he was done by the time, you know, that that guy had driven past him and seen him there. Um, They figured that he was parked along River Road because he was either running fresh wood through the chipper to clean it or he was just trying to get rid of some other evidence. So, the cool thing is, like, when they were in court, um, they actually were able to determine that 65 pieces of bone were cut with heavy type cutting edge that produced a crushing and cutting force. He said, or that um, that Dr. Um, Henry Lee, he, Dr. Lee had said that the bone, human tissue fibers, and hair were all mixed together with the wood chips and like pieces of like the plastic bag that the dismembered body parts had been wrapped in, um, but the same machine cut everything. So they were able to test that recovered chainsaw that they pulled out of the river, out of the mud. Um, they were able to figure out that this chainsaw was the one that actually dismembered Hella. 
So there were remnants of human tissue, blonde hair, and a number of blue fibers in the teeth of the blade. The blue fibers matched the rug inside the craft's home. They were able to also restore the serial numbers, even though it was heavily damaged. It matched a receipt belonging to Richard Crafts, indicating that he purchased this chainsaw on January 9th, 1981, paying $644.95. They couldn't find the receipt during the, during the search at his home, so they never knew about it. But he had had you know, that chainsaw for, you know, like five or six years before he used it to dismember his wife. So it was actually, oh, the receipt, I remember now, the receipt was actually mixed up in a bunch of personal papers that um, Hella Crafts had first given her PI, Keith Mayo. She had given him a box of personal papers that belonged to Richard for him to go through like when she first hired him. So it was like super ironic that that um, receipt was found in there later when they needed it. So unfortunately, the first time that uh, they went to court to um, charge this douchebag with murder, he was actually um, given a mistrial. Because one dumb fucking asshole kept holding out. He was stubborn and and illogical. Um, He kept, like, interpreting the evidence, like, really, like, basically stupidly. And he would not give a guilty verdict. So one of the other jurors had reflected that it was, like, reasoning with a child, you know, about the the one juror that was holding out, um, that he had real difficulty retaining any of the information or understanding any of the information. So he sounds like he was just a moron. Um, Another juror was even more blunt. She said, it wasn't chaos, it was hell. That's what she said to the press. Like, just having to deal with that. Because although all the jurors tried in vain to convince that one fucking asshole... In the end, he simply refused to participate any further. So, on January 15th, 1988, after 100 witnesses had testified and 650 exhibits were presented in an epic 53-day trial, a mistrial had to fucking be declared. So, that's just crazy. So, Richard Crafts had another chance at freedom. So the awesome thing is that he was he was um, found guilty the second time around. So um, they like worked on um, they worked diligently and on September 17th, 1989, the second trial opened. but you know of course they were uncertain. I mean they had to go through all the same evidence with all the same people testifying. Um, It was just basically an exact replay of the first trial. So I'm sure that had to have been stressful for everybody involved and, like, kept Hella's friends, families, and everyone who loved her. I mean, I can't even imagine. Like, it doesn't say anything in any of my, um, any of the information that I went over to to record this this episode it doesn't say anything about the kids but I just can't even imagine you know how upsetting all of this was you know for those three children I mean I I just literally can't imagine so when the case finally went to the new jury the second jury on November 20th of 1989 Thankfully, it only took them eight hours to reach a unanimous guilty verdict. He was found guilty of murder without any question. They put him away, um, which is fucking awesome. So on that day, he was, Richard Crafts was like not sorry. He was unrepentant. He was defiant as always, although he had received a sentence of 99 years in state prison, which is fucked when you think about it. Like, I, in some instances, believe in the death penalty. I guess 
Connecticut must not be a death penalty state. But some fucking asshole like this that is obviously guilty deserves, I think, the death penalty. You may think differently, and that's cool. We can agree to disagree. But he's not even getting a life fucking sentence. He's getting 99 years in state prison. So this is the crazy thing, guys. This fucking... I'm trying to think of, like, the worst word in the world, and I stop myself. But you might, like, insert your own word into this blank. This fucking blank is now out of prison. Like, he's, I think, 80. He's in his 80s, so he's an old man, and he lives in, like, a halfway house. But he was released because I guess he showed good behavior Um, He is not in fucking prison anymore. Like, for the life of me, I don't understand why. Like, so he was convicted in 1989. So he only did like 30-something years or maybe 30. Like, that is ridiculous to me that he is out. I I don't think that's fair. Um, But anyways, guys, that is the case of Richard Crafts. The wood chip killer. The wood chip murderer, is that what they call him? I don't know. But, <laughs> oh my gosh, it just fucking freaks me out the lengths that somebody will go to to kill someone that they're supposedly supposed to love and cherish and honor for, you know, the rest of their lives. So, whatever. Till death do you part, but. He wanted to expedite that death part for sure, huh? Um, Anyways, guys, I hope that you enjoyed this episode. Please reach out to me on social. I'm on Instagram. Um, Let me know if there's a certain case that you would like to see. Please rate this. If you're listening on Spotify, you can rate this podcast. You can leave me comments. You can share with your friends. Tell all of your friends. Tell all of your crime, your true crime loving friends about this podcast. I really, really appreciate it. It's fun so far. I know we're only a couple episodes in, but um, yeah, it's going to be a fun journey that we are going to take together. I have so many more awesome and gruesome and disgustingly like crazy cases to discuss with you guys. I love telling you guys these stories. So in the meantime, keep talking crime, keep thinking about crime. I know I will be.